I think I have devised some uncommonly delicious cinnamon rolls. Really buttery and tender, but also fluffy, and they hold a real tidy shape in the oven. I'll show you the standard sugar glaze, but I'm also going to show you an unconventional frosting inspired by marshmallow fluff. I love this frosting. My wife hates it. We report. You decide. To make a yeast dough that is extremely buttery, but also has a strong enough gluten network to rise, we need to follow a kind of weird procedure. I've got a mixing bowl and that's a third of a cup of milk, 80 mils. And I'll throw a little pinch of sugar in there for the yeast, even though they probably don't need it. They do need me to heat this up a little bit, which you could do in the microwave, but my stove has the advantage of being right here. I'm just looking for body temperature or something a little north of that. I'm only making half a dozen rolls today, and yet I'm putting in a whole packet of dry yeast, which is a lot, seven grams, more than two teaspoons. You could use half that, but I like the flavor I get from extra yeast, and I will let them rehydrate and wake up while I grab butter. Two tablespoons of butter, 30 grams. I'll melt that in the microwave real quick. And then in goes a quarter cup of granulated sugar, 50 grams. That sugar will lower the temperature of the butter, thus making it safe for my egg. If you were going to bake a full dozen, you could just use the whole egg, but I'm making half that, so I'm just going to use the yolk in my dough. Pure yolk makes the rolls taste a little better anyway, and I have plans for that white. In goes three or four grams of salt, which is like half a teaspoon of this Morton kosher. I think cinnamon rolls are far better with a noticeable amount of salt in them. And lastly, a little glug of vanilla, which you can skip. The frosting will have vanilla in it too. Get all that stirred up and smooth. My yeast is all frothy, so it's time for flour. You could use all-purpose flour, but I think bread flour is better. And lately I'm loving this double zero pizza flour that recently arrived at my grocery store. Hashtag not an ad, just a fan. Double zero is a super fine grind of flour, and it makes these rolls noticeably smoother, but any flour is fine. The extra protein of the bread flour will help these rise in spite of all that butter and also give them a heavier and silkier mouthfeel. Literally just as much flour as I can stir in there. If you want precise measurements, watch somebody else. I think it depends on what kind of flour you're using anyway, so I say just go by feel. As much flour as you can easily stir into this much liquid, which for me ended up being just under a cup. That I will simply leave to autolyze and pre-ferment for about a half hour. Over here with my fatty liquids, I might as well stir in some flour too. Again, just as much as I can stir in which ended up being maybe two-thirds of a cup. There's so much fat in here that the gluten in this flour basically won't be able to develop at all, but at least I can get the particles hydrating a bit, which will cut down on kneading time. Plus, all the greasy liquid here will be much easier to integrate with the other dough when it's in paste form like this. Okay, I'll just cover everything in a damp towel and come back half an hour later. Clearly, a lot of fermentation and gluten development has happened. If we'd mixed everything together at once, the huge amount of butter and sugar in this recipe would not have allowed that kind of rise. I'll dust more flour on there and dump in my greasy paste, use my floury hand to scrape off the spoon and get to kneading. Knead until this is homogenous, dusting flour as necessary to keep it workable. Kind of groovy at this stage. Yes, lots of popular cinnamon roll recipes have you mix everything together at once, but you will note they probably have proportionally less butter than mine here. I've tried doing the direct mix on a dough this rich, and it just doesn't rise. You do it this way, you get the best of all worlds. I want enough flour in here so that the dough is still a little sticky, but I can form it into a reasonably smooth ball. Perfect. Maybe two cups total of this double zero bread flour in here, maybe 250 grams. Cover and let it rise again until doubled, an hour or two, during which time we can clean up and maybe listen to a podcast. Hey, this guy has a new podcast available everywhere, and we can crank it on the new mini speaker from Cove, the sponsor of this video. I was filming a recipe where I cooked a steak in a pan big sound from an adorable little package. This connects to your phone or whatever via Bluetooth 5.0 or a simple cable if you want. Great battery life, great big sound, and get this, you can buy another one and chain them together with the push of a button. Now you've got true stereo sound that you can use to fill the whole room. The speakers are water resistant and they have a built-in microphone with a 30-foot range so you can talk to your phone. Pretty sweet. Buy one or two Cove mini commuter speakers with my link and code in the description and you will save 
67% or more. Link in the description. Use code AMINI67 for 67% off the Cove Mini Commuter. Thank you, Cove. So after two hours, this has about doubled. Don't be concerned if you don't get a huge rise at this stage. Again, there's a lot of fat and sugar in there. Pull her out to a board and a little dusting of flour so nothing sticks, and then roll this out to a rectangle that's about a foot wide, 30 centimeters. The closer you can get it to a perfect rectangle, the less waste you're going to have at the ends. The bottom long edge, I want to roll way thinner than the rest. This will be the flap that I use to seal the roll. Let me get some more melted butter ready, another couple tablespoons. We'll use this for a couple of things now, and this bowl's already dirty, so filling. A third of a cup of brown sugar, 65 grams, or white sugar with a little glug of molasses, because that's all brown sugar is, and I actually want more molasses than brown sugar normally has, so heavy hand with the molasses. The eponymous cinnamon. I like a whole tablespoon for six rolls, which is a lot, but I like it spicy. This is pre-ground, and pre-ground is generally less powerful, so you need more with it. A teeny little pinch of salt is good, and then this is important, just enough melted butter to make this the consistency of like damp sand. I'll stir this up real good and then see if I need more. If you put too much butter in the filling, it'll all melt out during the baking and just run all over the pan. But I need a little more in there just to make the filling hold together. If there's no butter at all, the filling is powdery and it just falls out of the roll before you can even bake the thing. There, that consistency is a good compromise. Take some melted butter and grease up the inside of the dough sheet, avoiding that thin flap at the bottom. We want that to be the opposite of slippery. Dump on the filling and pat it as evenly as possible. Don't bother getting it all the way to the edges on the sides because we're just going to trim off that excess anyway. And keep it off that flap at the bottom. That's our seal. And accordingly, I'm going to get it wet, plain water. This will glue the whole roll together and keep it from bursting open in the oven. Time to roll, starting with the long, thick end. Don't stress about rolling this super tight. It's even better if you don't. Give the layers some room to puff up in the oven. Get the seal on the bottom so gravity presses it down a little bit. And at this stage, you could just put the whole roll in the fridge, slice it, and bake it for breakfast in the morning. I've got some leftover melted butter, so I might as well rub it suggestively around the whole cylinder. This will make the edges bake up even tastier. And there we go. Time to slice. Trim off that end first, and then you can get really clean, even slices. I'm going maybe an inch and a half thick, four centimeters, aiming for six rolls, and there we go. Grab a baking sheet lined with parchment if you've got it, and then very gently lay on the slices cut side up. This would actually be a lot easier if I had chilled the roll overnight. So if you do that, you definitely want to cover these and let them warm up and proof at least a half hour before baking, which I'm going to do anyway. They're a little puffier after a half hour proof, which is good. And in they go at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 C convection if you've got it. While we wait, here's that weird frosting I was telling you about. My reserved egg white goes into a saucepan along with another third of a cup of sugar, 65 grams, heat on medium, and then whisk continuously. If you aren't whisking when this reaches the critical temperature, you're going to suddenly have scrambled eggs. Oh, I forgot. We need a glug of corn syrup or honey or some syrup that is not all sucrose like the table sugar is. If you don't use the syrup, the sugar recrystallizes and gets super grainy. Just keep whisking and you'll see the egg protein start to coagulate and thicken. And two minutes later, I've got a mayonnaise-like consistency. So I'm done. I'll turn off the burner and in the residual heat, I'll melt about a tablespoon of butter. Just melt it in real gently so it doesn't break. Time for a splash of vanilla. Whisk that in, and there you go. Marshmallow glaze. It's Italian meringue, but a little thinner and richer, which makes it better for a thin coating. It has a strong marshmallowy flavor, which I believe is basically the taste of sugar plus protein. The rolls have been baking for just about 10 minutes, and they're almost done, even though they look kind of pale. If you over-bake these, the filling just melts and leaks out, and you can see that starting to happen over there. Also, if you over-bake them, the centers start to push up like little spires, and eventually that causes the whole roll to fall apart. Plus, I think you want the texture to be soft and a little doughy, so when the edges are just a little golden, that's it. Out they come and let them cool until they're firm enough to pick up, maybe 10 minutes. Meanwhile, I'll mix up the more conventional glaze if you want to see that, which is just a pile of powdered sugar, a little glug of milk, and an even smaller glug of vanilla. Stir, 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 and really it takes a tiny amount of milk to get this all dissolved into a smooth, thick glaze. And you could glaze the rolls on their parchment paper, but hey, this is already dirty, so let's do this professional-like on a rack. This is my marshmallow glaze over here, and my preferred way of doing this is to just dunk in the top, get it completely coated in glaze, and as it drizzles down the sides on the rack, it'll spread in attractive ways. Alternatively, you could just 
just put one on the rack and drizzle with a spoon side to side, or you could do the little spiral pattern. Or if you're four and a half years old, you could just try total chaos. They can just mustard it. <laughs> mustard it, sure. That's the conventional glaze, by the way, made with the powdered sugar and milk, which looks about the same as the marshmallow one at this stage, but it tastes pretty different, and it dries to a more crispy texture with a matte finish. I like the marshmallow one better myself. Now, honestly, I know these don't look particularly remarkable, but the texture and flavor of these is way better than any homemade cinnamon roll I've ever had before, including all the ones I've made before. That pre-ferment step just makes all the difference in the world. Try it if you don't believe me.